$14 if you ordered one. And the shrimp boil t-shirts, they're here, $11. So get with Kelly and you can pick those up. She'll get you taken care of. And those are the announcements I have for this morning. Thank you. Good morning once again. And that was uh, weak, so we're going to try it one more time. Good morning once again. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're so pleased that God prompted you from the comfort of your home, your patio, your kitchen table, and brought you here. We count that to the work of the Holy Spirit, and we pray that something in this service touches your heart. Uh, we want to welcome especially those who are listening by radio or watching us on Facebook Live. If you're a first-time visitor with us this morning, we want to particularly welcome you and hope you feel comfortable filling out the visitor card and dropping it in the offering plate. We won't bug you, but we will give you a little more information about uh, the life of our church. At this time, would you bow with me for the invocation? Precious Lord, we enter your sanctuary to give thanks and praise, to confess that we have failed you, and to accept the grace that you so freely give. We gather in worship because you have called us to be a community of faith, a reminder that we are pilgrims together on this journey of faith. In this hour of worship, we ask that you might reveal yourself to us in some small way, word or song, in prayers, in the expressions of our neighbor, or in the holy meal. We open our hearts to you, O Lord, and dedicate this time to you through Christ our Savior. Amen.
sing. And one reminder before we have our gathering hymn this morning, please take your fifth Sunday insert and fill out once again your favorite hymns. And especially if we didn't get to yours last time and I've not hit it yet over the summer, now into the fall, just make me a note at the bottom that says, you did not sing my song. Now make sure you are here every week if you want to <laughs> tell me that. Sometimes I think I sang a song and the person that requested it was missing that week. So we're looking forward to another fifth Sunday sing in October. So please take a moment and put your favorites on there. Now stand with me if you would, singing 374, Standing on the Promises. We'll sing one, two, and four. <laughs> Apostles' Creed, which we say with both conviction and aspiration as we seek to live into these promises that we make. Let us say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the time in the life of our church where we pause to pray. We're instructed to pray without ceasing, but on a Sabbath day, it's important to set aside special time that we might come in humility and thanksgiving with our petitions and our needs. Uh, this morning, uh, of course, I turn your attention to the back of the bulletin where you will find prayer requests we continue to lift up. I want to add to this 
uh, Sherry Oglesby, who had shoulder surgery on Thursday. She's doing fairly well, though the surgery was uh, more extensive than they had hoped for. And we certainly want to remember all of those who were in the path of Ian. That includes Florida's devastation and now up into South Carolina and further. We pause now for just a moment of simple silence so that you can lift up quietly your own personal prayers of petition and thanksgiving. And so in these moments, let us bow before our God. Merciful God, we have learned from Jesus the power of trust in you. We confess that sometimes your ways seem a little too hard for us. But you have given us the gift of faith. And if it is a gift from you, then it is infused with your power. Make us truly grateful for this gift. Deepen our understanding, we pray, of what it means to have faith in you. And teach us to exercise our faith in you in service to one another and in service to the world. Help us to understand that your love so that we might trust your will. Give us grace to live as your children in this world. And give us the confidence to know that in spite of us, your spirit is powerfully at work in this world, and we are not a lost cause. There is hope and help in you. Fill us with that spirit, we pray. Allow that spirit to wash over us as we lift our individual sorrows and concerns, joys and celebrations. May the same spirit touch the persons and situations that we have named on our lips and in our hearts. Today, O oh God, as we celebrate Holy Communion with the rest of the world, we ask that you would clothe us in righteousness so that we may be worthy guests at your table. And now, merciful Lord, in your mercy, we beseech you to hear our prayers. In the name of Christ, who came teaching us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand again together for our offertory hymn, 714. I know whom I have believed, one, two, and four. <laughs>
Almighty God, in this season we began to consider thanksgiving and all the bounty you have bestowed upon us. We pause now to return these small portions that were never ours to begin with. And we know that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you might add a blessing to them that they would multiply to do the work of your kingdom here and everywhere. Bless them, we pray, and we dedicate them in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. That song always uh, tears me up, so I'm glad that uh, Tom is coming to read scripture and give me a chance to redeem myself here. I, I want to take a moment as Tom is coming forward to thank uh, Jing Lee, who is our accompanist here for today, taking uh, Beth Pierce's place. She comes from University of uh, Southern, Al uh, Southern Mississippi, and we appreciate her presence here so much. 
And Tom is the first of uh, a new, it's not a new tradition here. Years ago, we used to have lay readers of scripture every Sunday. And we're returning to that. And I'm pleased to say that the youth have taken over the month of October. If they can do it, when you get invited to read scripture, uh, don't say no. If they can do it, you can do it. And Tom, we, we thank you so much. The reading is from Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, put on your apron, and serve me while I eat and drink. Later you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are worthless slaves, and we have done only what we ought to have done. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Tom. O oh, ye of little faith, how often do we hear that expression? Well, this morning, uh, the invitation is to reconsider every time you make that expression, because the scripture this morning is about not the measure of faith, but the sufficiency of faith, and perhaps it will encourage you to look at a, a new way of bringing faith and having faith. Will you pray with me? And now, almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and each heart gathered here be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning's passage can be difficult to unpack, I think. It was difficult for me to unpack anyway. Now, verses 5 through 6 are about faith, and that seems simple enough. But the question is, is Jesus really just spending that time chastising his disciples for having so little faith? And what about verses 7 through 10? They're, they're the problematic ones. Now, they're actually about discipleship. That's what they're about. But then you, Jesus uses this illustration of a worthless slave to make his point. And we tend to read that through our 21st century eyes, and we get all the wrong impressions. He uses this illustration of a worthless slave to make his point, and taken out of context, that passage, it's, let's face it, it's just a downer. But taken together, Jesus seems to be saying that with faith, even the most mundane tasks of discipleship are possible. A better translation would have been to speak about the unworthy slave. We can identify with that a little more closely than this notion of worthlessness. The idea of an unworthy slave, this makes it about the nature of discipleship. You see, Jesus is not speaking to the disciples about identifying with the slave owner. He's asking them to identify with the slave, and they would have understood what that illustration meant. They are being challenged to see themselves as servants who serve without the expectation of reward. In the ancient world, to be a slave wasn't just a socioeconomic category. It also referred to someone who was wholly devoted to another. And discipleship requires steadfast devotion to Christ. But now here are the disciples, and they proclaim at the beginning of this passage, increase our faith. Now, there's an explanation point after that in my translation. It was an urgent demand on the part of the disciples. He's, they're laying a demand on Christ. They were desperate. On the face of things, that doesn't seem to be such a, a bad request. I mean, after all, don't we all want a great, greater measure of faith? Don't we pray that from time to time? 
How many times have we felt like our faith was too weak? Countless, no doubt. How many times have we said to ourselves, my faith is just not strong enough to do this or to do that? Or how many times have we said no to a job or a ministry at a church because we thought that position should go to somebody who has a stronger faith than ours? We didn't feel worthy to take on the position. How many times has something not gone our way and we automatically assumed it was because we had a lack of faith on our part? And the writer of Hebrews, you know this so well, says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen. That's true enough, but is that enough? And Jesus seems to be unpacking it for us a little bit more. Question for you, what comes to your mind when you hear that word faith? Maybe it's a person who comes to mind. Someone that you believe to be one of the most faithful people you've ever known. Maybe someone from the past who has gone on to glory. Most of us can name at least one person like that in our lives. For me, it was Miss Marble at Forest Hill Methodist Church. That woman had so much faith. And we think about these people in our lives that we believe to be exemplars of faith. And we ask, what was it about that person that made them so faithful? Do you aspire to be more like them? Do you pray that God might give you the faith of that person? Well, the disciples insisted that Jesus increase their faith. In fact, they demanded it. They were desperate. They were fearful. And Jesus replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. But did you hear how he phrased that? He said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed. In other words, Jesus' implication is that you don't even have faith the size of a mustard seed, a little bitty, teeny, tiny mustard seed. Y'all, Jesus is in a mood. He is frustrated with the disciples because they still don't get it. But to really understand this passage, we really need to go back and read the, the free, a few verses preceding it because really it's verses 1 through 10 that should be held together. So verses 1 through 4 say this. Jesus said to his disciples, occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and that you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender, and if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times a day and says, I repent, you must forgive, then you must forgive. Taken together, verses 1 through 10 is teaching the disciples four different things. It's warning them against causing others to stumble. It's challenging them to be forgiving. And it's calling on them to exercise faith. And finally, it's reminding them of the duties of discipleship, the duties of a servant who serves without want of reward. So here's where we are. The disciples have been told, don't cause anyone to stumble and forgive endlessly. Now they suddenly think that they don't have enough faith to do even that these hard commands. And they know that the consequences for failing in these commands will be as drastic as being thrown into the sea with a millstone around their neck. It's gonna be serious. They feel inadequate and they are afraid. It is actually fear that drives them to demand of Jesus that he increase their faith. Fear of failing and fear of punishment and fear of inadequacy. You see, they are blind to what they already have. I want you to hear that again. 
They are blind to what they already have. They assume that they just don't have enough. They don't realize that what God has already provided is sufficient. And so they make a demand about quantity of faith and Jesus, just like Jesus does, he pivots from the question and he changes it to a question of sufficiency of faith. You might think that Jesus would receive their request warmly, but instead his sharp, sharp response implies that they have really not understood genuine faith at all. And the question is, is Jesus chastising the apostles for a complete lack of faith, or rather is he encouraging them not to worry about the smallness of their faith? I think it's both. I'd like to believe it's both. We have a lot in common with those disciples. I, I learn that more every time I go to scripture. Sometimes we too struggle to understand the nature of genuine faith. We worry about the measure of our faith. But Jesus comes through and tells us it's not about the measure of your faith. It's not the quantity. Even faith that is as tiny as a mustard seed is sufficient. And why is it sufficient? Jesus is telling them because faith is a gift from God. And this is what we tend to forget. We don't earn it. It's a gift. We practice it. We nurture it. We embrace the daily disciplines so that we might become stronger. But it is a gift of God. And if it is a gift of God, then it is fused with the power of God. We have a lot in common with those disciples. If it's empowered with the power of the Almighty, it's enough faith to accomplish great and miraculous things. So why do we struggle with our faith? What do we do about, why, why do we doubt that our faith, large or small, is sufficient? And I believe we do. It's why we say no so many times. Perhaps our understanding of faith is simply too narrow. We often treat it like it's just wishful thinking or some kind of magic formula. If we just, we just have enough faith, it'll be like magic. We'll be healed. We'll get that job. We'll find that right person. We often act as if our faith is for the benefit of us only. But our acts of faith aren't just for our benefit. They are for the benefit of the whole community. Your individual faith creates a growth within the entire body of Christ. Our acts of faith are not just for us. The Gospel of Luke, more than any other gospel, gives understandings and definitions of faith. And I'm not going to quote them for you verse by verse, but we've got today's verse and then commentator Audrey West offers this as well. So think about expanding your understanding of faith. Faith is persistence in reaching out to Jesus. Faith is trusting in Jesus' power and authority. Faith is responding with love to a forgiveness received. Well, here's one I love. Faith is not letting fear get the upper hand. Whew, how often do we let fear get the upper hand? Faith is being willing to take risks that challenge the status quo. Faith is about giving praise to God. Faith is having confidence in God's desire for justice. And finally, faith is being willing to ask Jesus for what you need. We've got to ask him, y'all. He knows a word before it is uttered on our lips, but has called on us to come to him in humility and that quiet closet of prayer. This is faith. 
and faith the size of a mustard seed, gifted by God and infused with God's power, is sufficient for even the most demanding tasks of discipleship, and it is sufficient for the very tiny and very large demands of our lives. Doesn't mean we're going to get what we want always, but it means we'll never lose hope. We'll keep that hope because we have that faith. The disciples asked for more faith out of fear because they were blind to what they already had, and sometimes we're blind too, aren't we? Jesus is telling them, listen, you already have what you need. Now exercise it. Someone once said that to have faith means having our whole way of perceiving and responding to life transformed by the abundance of God's creative justice and power. Sometimes faith is about how we perceive the life that is going on around us. What seems impossible in our call to discipleship is possible for God. So what are we really asking for when we ask God to increase our faith? Are we seeking some kind of certainty? Are we seeking a kind of mystical experience that works like a drug and helps us get through ordinary challenges? Do we expect our faith to be no more than an antidote to struggle? But the key is to have faith in the midst of the struggle. Perhaps, perhaps, instead of always asking God to increase our faith, we ask God instead to remove our blinders that we might see and give thanks for the mustard seed we already have. Now listen, I look around this room and I know everybody here has a mustard seed of faith. So perhaps instead of asking God to increase our faith, we ask God to remove our blinders that we might see and give thanks for the mustard seed we already have and then ask God to use that mustard seed to transform our whole way of perceiving and responding to whatever life may bring our way. This is faith that produces abundantly more than we could ever hope to produce on our own. And it isn't faith just for our sake. Here's the really good news. It is faith so that God's kingdom might be realized here on this earth. Now that's good news. Let us hear it and believe. And this morning, let us all pause and give thanks for the great gift of faith that God has already bestowed upon us and then seek to live fully into that faith, trusting that even the tiniest amount is sufficient. Will you pray with me? God, we confess that we often lament our lack of faith. We blame ourselves for not having enough faith. Perhaps at times this is true, but you have promised that it is not the quantity of faith that matters, that when it comes to you, and it always does, it is already sufficient, even the size of a mustard seed. And so broaden and deepen our understanding of faith, and then teach us to share that faith on behalf of you, our God, and our faith giver. In Christ's name, amen. Today is World Communion Sunday, and it is celebrated literally across the world. Churches who intentionally celebrate communion on this day, that they might know they're doing it with their brothers and sisters in Christ, in the body of Christ around the world. And so think about that as we celebrate this morning. Before we turn to page 12, I'm going to take a, a moment of personal privilege. 
and I'm going to tell you a story about communion that may help make it a little more meaningful for you. When I was the pastor of evangelism at the Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas, it was a mega church, a huge. We had six worship services. And on one particular Sunday, it was Communion Sunday, and I was in the main sanctuary. I was over in, in my little spot, and we celebrated by intinction. So we had one loaf that a portion was broken off and one cup, and it was dipped in. Well, on this particular morning, the family, the Bryce family, the, the Roberts family walked up to, to my station, and there they were, all three of them. And Bryce, who was uh, six years old at the time, he got to, to me where I had the bread, and he just stood there. I said, Bryce? He said, this is my first time. I said, that's wonderful. D do you know what to do? And so he took the portion of bread, and he dipped it in the cup. He ate it, and he went on with his family. Well, when church was over, I was standing in the narthex visiting with people. I want to tell you, hundreds of people were in there. I'm short and hard to find. But all of a sudden, I feel this tug on the side of my robe, and there is Bryce. He has found me. And I look down at him, and he looks up at me, and with the biggest smile on his face, he said, I knew it would be sweet. Now, you and I know he was talking about the Welch's grape juice. But, oh, what a metaphor for this holiest meal of all. We know it will be sweet. And it is free and open to everyone in this church we have an open communion table. You do not need to be a member of this church or United Methodist to receive communion today. On this World Communion Sunday, I invite you to turn to page 12 in your United Methodist hymnal. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him all who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another as we say together, Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And beginning with the great thanksgiving in the middle of the next page. The Lord be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, 
gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And now, Almighty God, pour out your Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, and it is broken for you. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, let us remember him. I would invite Cash and Anna to come at this time. is broken for you. The body of Christ has broken for you. Court flesh and the blood of Christ shed for you. You can just be fat. This morning, the ushers will dismiss you and will come by aisles, as we always do. Come, kneel as you're able at the uh, prayer rail. Communion will be served, and then we will dismiss you with a prayer after each um, group comes up. The table is set. The feast is prepared. Won't you come and receive?
faith has brought you to this altar this day and your faith will take you away by the power of this meal you have received even more go now energized and refreshed to share it with the world amen As you have freely received this meal, go forth now to freely give, to be a witness of the redeeming power of Jesus Christ, and know that because of the nourishing power of the mystery of this holy meal, it will be possible. Go in faith. Amen. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves Christ's love for us. You have received that love in this holy meal. Leave and exchange the cares of your heart and go forth to be witnesses to the world beyond. Go in faith. Amen.
faith is a gift from God. It has brought you to this altar this morning. It will take you home and into your world. And it has been infused by the power of this holy meal. Strengthened by this meal, go forth to be the people of God and go in faith. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Almighty God, for this, the sweetest meal of all. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to share it together as a community of faith, knowing that when we look to our left and look to our right, we see your face and the faces of these that we share communion with. And now may those celebrating this meal all around the world feel our love and the power of your Holy Spirit extending from this church and into their lives wherever they may be. May this strengthen us for our days to come. We ask it all in Christ's holy name. Amen. We'd also like to take a moment to thank Jing Li again for playing for us today, and we hope that you will speak to her on your way out. So thank you again for playing for us. We appreciate it very much. Now, and don't let me forget the invitation one more time. <laughs> Christ our Lord invites all to this altar, and we want you to know that if uh, you have been seeking a very special personal relationship with Christ, come as we sing and be received. If you'd like to dedicate or rededicate your life to Christ, this is a good time to do so. Or if you'd just like to come to the altar and pray for a little while, it is open for you. The invitation is open and sincere, so come if you choose as we sing together. A stand, my faith looks up to thee. 452, we'll sing the first and last. again for worshiping us with us this day and we pray that something has touched your heart that will encourage you in the week to come now go in peace and may the love of God the redeeming power of Jesus Christ and the communion of saints go with each and every one of you we say it in Christ's name amen